With that, my name is uh, Andrew Adams. I'm the associate pastor here. If I haven't met you, I'd love to chat with you after service, get to know you guys a little bit. Um, second service, you're here, I'm here, but most, most importantly, the presence of God is here. Amen? Amen? All right, you guys ready to get in the word today? We're going to be in Matthew chapter 9. So with that, would you guys open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9, verse 35? Give you a moment to turn there, turn on your Bible, flip on your Bible, whatever your deal is, open your Bible to Matthew 9. All righty. Oh, and before we get too far ahead of ourselves, uh, can we acknowledge today is Veterans Day? Happy Veterans Day. Do we have any veterans in the audience? Would you, could you stand? We would just like to honor you and thank you for your service. Thank you, guys. All right. Matthew 9, 35. If you guys would please stand with me, we'll read the word of God. <coughs> Jesus continued going around to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Will you guys join me in prayer? King Jesus, we come before you earnestly desiring to hear your voice from these words spoken by your spirit. We acknowledge that these scriptures are breathed out by you inspired by your spirit and authoritative and sufficient in our lives. Would you minister to our hearts, to our minds, to our hands as we read through this text? Spirit, we give you permission to convict us. We give you permission to point to any part of our lives and ask for submission to you. We ask King Jesus, Will we not just be a church family that are hearers of the word of God, but would we be doers also? I ask Jesus that you would open our eyes to see, our ears to hear what you have to say to us. I earnestly ask Jesus, would you use me, a broken, sinful man, to declare your truth? Would you use us, a broken, sinful church to reach Everett. We pray as you pray, Jesus, would it be, would your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? We love you, Lord, and we want to learn to love you more. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. You guys may be seated. All righty. Have you guys ever found yourself so passionate about something, so happy and joyful about a particular thing that you just wanted to share it with someone? Have you ever found yourself in that place of passion and excitement that you did share it with someone and they didn't share your excitement? Disappointment. Maybe consider this. We live in Everett. There's lots of good food here. Maybe you're a foodie and you're like, man, Teriyaki, as far as the eye can see. And you're a local Everettian, Everetter, you live in Everett. And you have a particular teriyaki place. It's a slice of heaven on earth with a side of rice and gyoza. And the good person you are, you're like, man, I can't keep this to myself. It would be wrong. I need to share this with my friends. And so you bring your friends to the teriyaki place, the teriyaki haven. 
and you sit down and you order for them and you're like, don't worry, I know what to get you, just chill. And they're like, okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. And they start eating and you lean in and you watch and you wait in anticipation to see the illumination on their face, to see the revelation of God's goodness through teriyaki. And you ask, how is it? And they say, yeah, it's good. You say, it's good? Excuse me? What was that blasphemy that just came from your mouth? That's better than good. Has anyone ever experienced the disappointment of sharing your love with the people you love and they don't requit your love? Anyone ever felt that? Now, that's what we do as humans. That's naturally inside of us to share the things we care about with the people we care about. We've all experienced this in some way with our families. Parents, you know this. You share the things you love with your children. Dads especially know this, right? Dad likes hunting, dad's got a gun, dad gets son a little gun, right? Dad likes surfing, he's got a big surfboard, he gets his son a little surfboard to surf on, right? Now me personally, you guys know me, I like Star Wars. And so I do what any Star Wars fan would do, I got my son a lightsaber. In fact, I've got a video to show you of my son with a lightsaber. <laughs> Give it up for the tech team. <laughs> Thanks, tech team. Now, we know what it is to share the things we love with the people we love. And when they love it just as much as we do, we pour our love out on them. Parents, you know this. You pour your love out on the people you love when they love the things you love. But we also know the disappointment of sharing the thing you love with the people you love and they just don't get it. They're like, yeah, that's good. I get it. And you're like, no, no, you don't understand how good this is. I think sometimes that's how Jesus feels about his church. Jesus, being the God who came from heaven to earth to preach the gospel, passionate about the redemption of the lost, shares the thing he loves, the gospel, with the church. And I think if we're honest, sometimes we misunderstand the gospel. Like, yeah, cool, Jesus, thanks. And Jesus is like, no, 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 you don't get it. This is so much better than you really think. And here's what I mean by misunderstanding. Here are just a few examples. Sometimes we misunderstand the gospel like this. Well, the gospel is something you believe so you don't go to hell. It's fire insurance. Or maybe we misunderstand the gospel like this. The gospel is truth. That's the gospel truth. Or maybe we misunderstand the gospel like this. Well, the gospel is feeding people and helping the sick and taking care of the less fortunate. Or maybe even the far side, something that feels close to the truth, the gospel is where people are depraved and they need to go to heaven, and so they believe in Jesus to not go to hell and go to heaven. Each of these misunderstandings has truth in them, but it is not the totality of truth. And so we can misunderstand the gospel, the thing Jesus is passionate about, by seeing just a portion of one of these. It's almost as though I said, hey guys, let's go get Chinese food. And you're like, yes, I love Panda Express. <laughs> it's not the same. It's just not the same. And so as we look at Matthew 9 today, I want us to see Jesus's passion for the gospel. I want us to see that Jesus is God who reveals the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. So before we get there, let's, uh, let, let's backtrack a little bit and let's look forward to find out where we are now. So earlier in Matthew's gospel, we've seen Jesus declare the kingdom of God and himself as the king of God's kingdom. Specifically, we've seen Jesus display this through miraculous healing, casting out demons, and raising the dead. Said differently, Matthew, the author of this gospel, is showing us Jesus has authority over sin, death, and the grave. Let's remember Matthew's audience. 
His original audience he was writing to were Jews who were looking for the Messiah, the long-awaited king of Israel. Matthew's also writing to ancient Christians who are Jewish. And these ancient Christians would have been facing persecution, struggling with the pressure to renounce Jesus in light of their Jewish heritage. And so Matthew was trying to convince them, Jesus is the Messiah, don't leave him. If you leave him, you leave the kingdom. And so Matthew shows us this in Matthew 9, 18. He shows us Jesus has power over sin. He forgives people of their sin. In verse 24 of chapter 9, Matthew shows Jesus raising a girl back from dead, showing that Jesus is stronger than the grave. And in verse 32, Sean taught us last week, Jesus happens upon a mute man, a man with a physical ailment, a physical uh, disability. But Jesus notices that there's a spiritual root to this disability, and it's demonic. And Jesus casts a demon out of this man, and suddenly the man who was once mute can now speak. Matthew is showing us that Jesus has power over demons too. And so we see Jesus is a king who has power over sin, death, and the grave. Something for us to consider, church, as we go through this, if that's what the king of the kingdom is like, what is his kingdom like? If the king has power over sin, death, and the grave, what does the kingdom have power over? Something I wanna teach us, I wanna teach us a hermeneutic. That's a, that's a fancy Bible word for how we read the text. As we're reading, because this is what we do, we're Americans. We go to the movies, we watch Marvel, we're like, oh yeah, I'm the superhero too. And you go to bed fantasizing about being Thor and welding the hammer, right? And so we we bring that lens to the Bible sometimes. And we see Jesus performing miracles, and it's not wrong for us to think of his church as an extension of Jesus's ministry, but that's secondary to seeing what Jesus is doing. Second, uh, said differently, as we're reading the gospel, we need to be asking, what does this say about the king? What does this say about the kingdom? Does that make sense? So, Maybe write that down as you're doing your devotions. Think through this lens. What is this text teaching me about the King Jesus? And what is this teaching me about King Jesus's kingdom? Now, that's where we've been in the book of Matthew. Let's take a quick glance, 2024 and forward. Where will we be going in the book of Matthew? In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus will send out his disciples. He will invite them into the very ministry he has been doing up till this point. Not just proclaiming the gospel and teaching, but healing the sick, cleansing lepers, casting out demons, and declaring the kingdom of God. We will learn that the kingdom of God is not a static thing that can be contained, but it must expand to the boundaries of the earth. We'll learn that the word apostle, we like hear that word and we're like, oh, that's a really Christianese word. Apostle literally just means messenger or sent one. And that's interesting. Jesus is calling his disciples to be as he is. Everyone's favorite verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And now Jesus sends his disciples and now us, as the church, the spirit sends us. We'll see in the coming chapters of Matthew, when Jesus and his disciples present the gospel, people will have one of two reactions. People will receive the gospel and be saved and follow Jesus and be healed, or people will full out, bold face, reject Jesus and the gospel. And when they do, we also see Persecution comes into play. Jesus and his disciples will face persecution. And Jesus will then begin to teach about himself and his kingdom through parables. Parables to confuse the wise, to confound the cynic, but also to reveal truth to the seeker and those looking for Jesus. And this will all lead 
to Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. So that's where we're going, and that's where we've been. Let's look at where we are today. This passage in Matthew chapter 9 is a bridge. It's a little bookend, if you will, connecting Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and healing ministry to where he's going to go and where his disciples will go into mission. So let's read Matthew 9, 35. Jesus continued going around to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. So we might say this, Jesus's ministry can be uh, defined in a threefold term or in threefold phrase as proclaiming, teaching, and healing. And this is merely a summary statement So this isn't an exhaustive list of everything Jesus did. It's a summary. Even though it's a summary, I want to encourage us, church, let's not be tempted to throw away this verse. Within this verse is actually a beautiful window into the kingdom of heaven. So as we go through this passage, what we're going to do is explain verse by verse like we usually do. And then at the end, for about five minutes or so, I want to give us a theology of the kingdom of heaven the gospel of the kingdom. Because again, this is the thing Jesus is passionate about. And he wants to share it with us, the people he loves. And us as lovers of Jesus don't want to misunderstand his gospel, right? So, Matthew 9, 35. We see Jesus going to all the towns and villages. Not some of them, all of them. And Jesus is committed to his messianic mission. A Messiah, not only that heals, he's not a performer, he's a Messiah that saves. Now, let's notice this, how beautiful this is. Jesus comes to us. This is the seed of the gospel, right? It's not that I found Jesus, it's not that you found Jesus, it's that Jesus found us. It's a picture of the incarnation that God became human flesh and sought us. This is an affront to every religion and gospel on the face of the earth that's not the true gospel, right? In our flesh, in these other religions, we think, what can I do to appease God? What can I do to get to God? It's the Tower of Babel, right? Let us build a tower to reach into the heavens. But Jesus comes to us. He comes to our towns and villages, and that's what he does in this passage. Jesus shows us that God is a missionary God. That's good news. It's been said before, and it bears saying again, the gospel isn't that we found God, it's that he found us. This didn't start in the New Testament either. God has always been operating this way. This is the story, actually, of the entire scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. Think of it. Abraham, in Genesis 11, is with his father, Terah. And they are, they're pagans, essentially. They're worshiping Sumerian gods. And Yahweh, creator God, seeks Abraham and calls him. Let's look at Moses. Moses is in the desert with sheep, doing shepherd things. And God speaks to him out of a bush. It's not that Moses pursued God, but God pursued Moses. Think of David. David is the least desirable of all of Jesse's sons, right? He's just the little shepherd boy out in the field. And God sends his prophet to find David. There's good news for you. If you're here thinking, that you're unseen, feeling insecure, feeling insufficient. The good news is you don't have to seek God out. He is seeking you out. That is the beauty of Jesus. He seeks to save the lost. Remember earlier in Matthew chapter nine, Jesus teaches the scribes and Pharisees and John's disciples It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. 
That's good news for us who feel pressured to come to church and put on our best face and be as moral as we can and be as put together as we can. That's good news to people who live in a generation that constantly has a camera on them, that constantly is expected to put forth your most curated, cool, sexy self. You can be unhinged, wrecked, broken, sinful in front of God, and he will pursue you. We worship and serve a missionary God. Now we see that Jesus goes out seeking healing and restoring in the town's synagogues. Synagogues, here's a good little one-to-one, were essentially the churches of the Jewish community. It was little uh, places of gathering where the community would come together and sing psalms and hymns and read the Torah together, the first five books of the Old Testament. There's no sacrificial system. They had to go to Jerusalem for that. And so Jesus is essentially coming to the, the village's community centers, and he's seeking people where they are to be found, and he's teaching them. When we see Jesus teaching, it's most likely to be expected that Jesus is teaching out of the Torah, which reminds us Jesus is presenting himself to these people as a rabbi. But we also see that he's proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. What does that mean? We'll address it in a little bit, but for right now, here's what I want us to see. We've got a slide for this. The word gospel or good news comes from the Greek word euangelion, which can be translated as a message of God's salvation. So Jesus is going into their synagogues proclaiming that Yahweh, creator God, is now here and he's here to save his people. Now, some people may have misunderstood this. They may have thought, okay, Jesus is here to save us from the Romans. He's a military leader, and he's here to lead a revolution. But remember, Matthew is showing us that Jesus is here to save us from sin, death, and the devil. So Jesus goes on this mission trip, teaching from the Torah, teaching his kingdom ethic, the Sermon on the Mount. And lastly, he'll back up all of his teaching and proclaiming with miracles of healing, every disease and every sickness. In the next verse, we see something even more miraculous. Verse 36, Jesus isn't just a man on a mindless mission proclaiming a message. He cares for us and sees us. Look how beautiful this is. Verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. We learn that the king of the kingdom, God himself, has compassion on us. That's incredible. Now the word compassion, if we're to analyze its Latin origins, the word passion means to suffer. And the word cone is with. So not only is Jesus empathizing with us, but he is suffering with us. On his ministry tour, Jesus isn't just doing the work, he's also relationally connected to our suffering. And this is beautiful because though the truth is we are sinners in need of a savior, there's also a truth that we suffer because of things done to us. Not just things we've done to ourselves, but things we do to others and others do to us. And Jesus has compassion on us. He has compassion in those moments for us. One of my favorite theologians, Leon Morris, says this. This is said of Jesus again in Matthew 14, Matthew 15, and Matthew 20. In the New Testament, this verb, compassion, is always and only used of Jesus. It's almost as if we're supposed to see this not as just an emotional characteristic of Jesus, but a messianic characteristic of Jesus. This changes how we think about the gospel, doesn't it? We worship a God, are saved by a God who is compassionate towards us. His heart for us is a shepherd seeing sheep who are lost. How many of you guys have worked with sheep before? Just a show of hands. Anyone, FFA, 4-H, 
Okay, so if you guys know the Nielsen family, they own sheep. So they, they told me, if you guys want to be around sheep, talk to the Nelsons, and you will see that sheep are extremely cute, yes, but they're extremely stupid also. And Jesus says that we're like sheep. You're like, did Andrew just call me stupid? But I also said you were cute, okay? So. But isn't that the truth? The Nielsons were literally telling me they've seen sheep get lost around their food, even though it's right next to them. Is that insane? And Jesus sees us like these sheep, knowing that we need leadership and guidance. But not just harsh leadership and guidance. Remember, Jesus has compassion. This is the type of guidance and leadership he brings into our lives. Now, it's, this passage is really interesting. The specific verse here has tons of Old Testament allusions. I only have time to get into two of them. Is that okay? Okay. The specific reference of sheep without a shepherd is primarily found in Numbers 27, 17. We've got a slide for it. I'll read it for us. This is Moses praying to God. Who will go out before them and come back in before them? Who will bring them out and bring them in? So that the Lord's community won't be like the sheep without a shepherd. So the context of this verse is Moses is about to retire in his long tenure as Israel's leader. And he's asking God, God, you got to give Israel a leader. They're like sheep without a shepherd. They're just going to get lost in a circle, walking around. You got to send them a leader. Okay, Bible quiz. Who does God send? Shout it out. Joshua. Joshua. Now, really interesting here. Jesus' name in the Hebrew is Yeshua, which is almost the exact same as Joshua. Both of their names in the Hebrew mean Yahweh saves. So the person that God sends to lead his people into the promised land is a man named Yahweh saves. God sends him in the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is who God sends to us to save us and lead us, Jesus, Yahweh saves now, the second reference I want to put in front of us is Ezekiel 34, verse 5. This is a long passage, so I'm just going to read it for us. Um, buckle up. Ezekiel 5, uh, 34, 5. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd. They became food for all the wild animals when they were scattered. My flock went astray on all the mountains and every high hill. My flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth and there was no one searching or seeking for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, this is the declaration of the Lord God because my flock lacking a shepherd has become prey and food for every wild animal. And because my shepherds do not search for my flock because my shepherds feed themselves rather than my flock. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God says. I am against the shepherds. I will demand my flock from them and prevent them from shepherding the flock. The shepherds will no longer feed themselves for I will rescue my flock from their mouths so that they will not be food for them. For this is what the Lord God says. See, I myself will search for my flock and look for them. That's beautiful. This is the prophet Ezekiel writing to the community of Israel in a time where their leaders were abusing them and taking advantage of them, spiritual leaders and political leaders. And God prophesies through Israel, I will take my flock from you and I will lead them myself. And we see the scripture fulfilled in Jesus, not just then, but for all of history this is an image of God and his upside-down kingdom. God values those who are usually taken advantage of, and he wants to give them compassion and good and healing leadership. What I want us to get from these two Old Testament passages is Jesus is the shepherd we are all waiting for. 
the word biblical commentary says this. What causes Jesus' deep compassion at this point is not the, abundant, the abundance of sickness, but rather the great spiritual need of the people whose lives have no center, whose existence seems aimless, whose experience is one of futility. The whole gospel is a response to just this one universal need. Isn't that true of us? At the end of the day, when we look at our lives, pre-Jesus, we were without purpose, just doing whatever, whatever we felt like doing, whatever our emotions demanded of us in the moment, whatever our desires wanted bad enough, we did that and we had no purpose. But with Jesus, we have guidance and leadership. We have a shepherd who will take care of us, who will lead us, Matthew 9, 37, Jesus says to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. So Jesus, going out on his mission trip, sees the great need, the great broken state of humanity. He has compassion on us, and this compassion brings him back to his disciples and tells them, pray. Pray earnestly to send out workers into the harvest. Now, if you didn't notice, this is a metaphor. Jesus is using an uh, agrarian, agrarian, an agriculture analogy <laughs> to convey a truth to his disciples. He's not calling into question the quantity of workers, excuse me, he is calling into question the quantity of workers, saying that there is a great, great quality of harvest. So Jesus, motivated by his compassion and love for people, invites the ones he loves into the thing he loves so that people can be saved. We're reminded Jesus is a missionary God who loves to save and redeem. Now, before we get ahead of ourselves, it could be really easy to be like, okay, church, now let's go on mission. But we need to acknowledge our sinful tendency is to put hands to work before we seek God. Jesus tells his disciples, first thing you do is pray. Now, if you were to cheat ahead and look at Matthew 10, Jesus will send out his disciples as the answers to their prayers but that doesn't excuse us from the hard work of praying earnestly and seeking God. I think we need to take a moment of application and recognize. So many of us are so quick to think of what to do, systematize and plan and come up with a strategy. But what if before we did any of that, we were just determined to pray and seek the Lord of the harvest, to ask him to move on our behalf, I think Jesus is teaching us again that there's power in our prayer to him. Jesus is calling us to be prayers and to be goers. Now, I wanna backtrack really quickly to verse 35 and zoom in on the phrase, the good news of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is a massive theme in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. You'll see it everywhere. And Matthew especially loves this theological idea. Now, remember, this is Jesus's great passion, and he is sharing it with us, the ones he loves. And if we love Jesus, we want to do our best to understand it, right? So, really quickly, what is the kingdom of God? Number one, the kingdom of God has to have a king. And we see really clearly revealed in the Old Testament, the king is Yahweh. Now revealed to us in Matthew's gospel, Jesus is the king of God's kingdom. Secondly, we see the king has a way of kinging, but we wouldn't say that because it sounds weird in the English. So you might say this, a manager's, Managing style, how a king rules. Jesus 
rules his kingdom, number one, by redeeming people, and number two, by governing his people. So by bringing people in, making them new, buying them back from sin, death, and the devil, and then once we are in the kingdom, Jesus is the Lord of our life. So a way to think of that is the old statement, if Jesus isn't Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. So the idea is that Jesus can put his finger on any area in our life and we say, yes, Jesus, you're my Lord, my King, and my God. I'll do as you say. Last, uh, thirdly, excuse me, the kingdom has a people. A good way of thinking of this is citizens of the kingdom. In the Old Testament, we see this revealed as the nation of Israel. In the New Testament, Jesus brings the church people of every nation into his kingdom. Fourthly, the kingdom has a law that the citizens abide by. Now think about this. In Exodus 32, I want to say, don't quote me on that, Moses comes down from the mountain with two stone tablets, the law of God, the Ten Commandments. Matthew 5, Jesus goes up the mountain and preaches the Sermon on the Mount the fulfilled law of God, what it will be like to live and experience the kingdom of God. Lastly, number five, the kingdom must have a land. Otherwise said, the kingdom must have a domain. Really easily, we see that it's the nation, geographical Israel in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, we learn the kingdom is wherever the church is. Now, those are some bullet points about the kingdom of God. Really clearly said, what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is Jesus is the king. Jesus rules his kingdom with redemption and governing. He governs his people, the church. The church lives by Jesus' kingdom ethic, the Sermon on the Mount. And the church expands the borders of the kingdom wherever the church goes. Now, what is the gospel of the kingdom. Remember, the gospel can be translated as good news. So to help us understand this, before we get the good news, I wanna give us the bad news, is that okay? Okay. What's the bad news of the kingdom of God? Well, in Genesis one through three, we see creator God, Yahweh, create and speak the universe into existence. And he creates a garden where his presence will dwell. Now, an Old Testament theme, wherever God's presence is, that place is usually a temple, a place of worship where his presence is mediated. Now, God creates priests in this garden temple named Adam and Eve, and he invites them to share in his image. Really simply said what that means, God is a manager, a ruler, a king, and so he invites Adam and Eve to manage, to rule, to king. In Genesis 1, it says, God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. So we see God invites Adam and Eve into the thing he loves with the people he loves. Y'all seeing this? He co-rules and reigns with his kids. But sadly, we know humans, human, and Adam and Eve through a coup d'etat, and they overthrow God. And the consequence of their rebellion is they are thrown out of the kingdom. Now, God hasn't given up on his kingdom plan. He hasn't given up on his kingdom. And so what God does is he picks Abraham and he says, out of your family, I will establish my kingdom again. And eventually Moses would lead Abraham's family out of Egypt into the promised land. And Moses would come to God and say in Exodus 33, if your presence does not go with us, Moses responded, don't make us go up from here. How will it be known to us and I, your people have found favor with you unless you go with us? I and your people will be distinguished by this from all the other people on the face of the earth. Verse 17, the Lord answered Moses, I will do this very thing that you have asked of me, for you have found favor with me, and I know you by name. 
So essentially, Moses says to God, if this is your people and you're sending us to the domain, the land, we need your presence to be with us. So here's a little nugget. At the center of a kingdom must be the king on his throne. And Moses gets this. He sees, God, if you don't go with us, we're going to get pwned, essentially. We're going to get destroyed. We're going to be like sheep, lost, just walking in a circle. We need you to go with us. And so God concedes to Moses. He says, okay, I will go with you. And if we read the narrative, we see that God decides to go with the people of Israel in a special way. His presence will reside in a mobile temple called the tabernacle. So, God tells them to make this mobile temple, and he leads them into the domain, the land, the promised land, Israel. And this was God's heart for them, that God himself would be their king. They would have no need of a human king because he would rule and reign justly, lovingly, compassionately. But again, human's human. And they say, you know what, God? I think we want a person to be our king. And so God gives us what we want. And the cycle of the human story repeats over and over in the Old Testament. Israel falls into idolatry, rebellion, disdain, and destruction. That's the bad news of the kingdom. What's the good news of the kingdom? Jesus shows up. Matthew 5 through 7 teaches the ethics of his kingdom, announces he is the king of God's kingdom, come in flesh as God in person. The good news is Jesus is their long-awaited king, and he will rule and reign with blessing and redemption. I want to show you guys something really quickly. It's really beautiful. When we think about the kingdom of God, we have a lot of misconceptions about it. Jesus shows People, this will be the consistency of his kingdom. This is Matthew 5, verse 3 through 5. Just a little snippet, just to show you what it's like. Jesus says this is what his kingdom will be like. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. This is a new kind of kingdom that is unlike any other kingdom that has existed. Most kings rule with fear and force and violence. Jesus will rule with compassion and love. And we will see him enthroned on his throne with his death on the cross. It's the upside down kingdom. And then we see in Matthew 28, Jesus expands the domain of his kingdom beyond Israel. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus tells his disciples this after his resurrection. Verse 18, Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So remember, this kingdom, this idea that Jesus is the king He rules and reigns with a new law. His people is the church. His land will be wherever the church goes into all nations. This is the thing that Jesus is passionate about and cares about, and he wants to share with us the people he loves. Now, we're reminded at the end of this passage, Jesus tells his disciples, the harvest is abundant, the workers are few. The potential of the kingdom is great, but sometimes not so great is our enthusiasm and our efforts to expand it. The hard truth of the matter, many of us, myself included, we make excuses for why we don't need to be excited about the kingdom, why we don't need to expand the kingdom. We think to ourselves, well, I'm just... I'm just not gifted like that. I don't know. I don't talk to people. I'm awkward. I'm introverted. I don't know. Well, I'm a new Christian, and so I I just need a little bit more time. Or maybe even, you know what, Jesus? 
I'm just too busy right now. I don't have time to expand the kingdom. What does that even mean? Yet Jesus models to us that he himself, as the king, will become the servant of all. Isn't that beautiful? The one who is worthy of it all, worthy of all praise, honor, and glory, goes low and serves and washes feet and expands the kingdom. Jesus sets the tone and tenor for the kingdom by showing that the first will be last and the last will be first. And so I think under our excuses is a fear of humbling ourselves, a fear of going low and being a servant like Jesus. We're reminded that the kingdom isn't static. It must grow, it must expand, and through the humility and effort of his church. Now remember, as I buy my son a lightsaber and share with him my great joy and find joy in him when he has fun playing Star Wars and doing the whole thing, Jesus finds joy in us, his church, as we grab the gospel, as we grab the kingdom and become passionate about the lost. So, here's where we'll end. There are those of us who've been riding the fence for a while. Maybe you've been coming to church here. Maybe you've been checking out a few churches. You've been peering over the walls of the kingdom, so to speak. You're like, man, I love what Christianity has to offer. I love what the church has to offer. The coffee, eh. But here's the reality of the situation. We don't get into the kingdom of God by coming to church, by attending, by being around long enough. The only entrance into the kingdom of God is by placing our allegiance into the king who is God. And so there are those of us here who have yet to do that in our hearts and minds say, Jesus, you are my king. And so if that's you, your step of application today is to place your allegiance in Jesus. I'm gonna ask you to do something scary if that's you. We'll have the prayer team come up here as the band starts to play, as communion comes out, and I want you to come to someone on the prayer team. Maybe find another person in this room, someone you know, and say, hey, I have yet to place my allegiance in Jesus. I need to come under the authority of his kingdom. I need to believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is king. Maybe that's you. Some of us, we've been coming to church for a while. We've been Christians for a while. And it's easy to think the longer you're saved, the more spiritually mature you are. But if we look at our attitudes, myself included, we have the disposition of a spiritual child, right? Everyone's seen the child who only thinks about themselves. And that's just natural, right? That's what children do. But at a certain point, we have to get our eyes off ourselves and start thinking of the needs of others. Maybe our fear of evangelism, maybe our fear of sharing the kingdom of God has less to do with talking to people and more to do with our fear of discomfort. Maybe we need to mature and take a step of faith and be uncomfortable. Maybe we need to look at Jesus and see God coming down, becoming a human, and dying a very uncomfortable death on the cross. Now I don't just wanna slap you with, you just like to be comfortable all the time, because I do too. Your application is to take the step of Jesus and have compassion on the world outside of you. I really believe that when we start praying and asking God, the Lord of the harvest to send out workers, he will create in us compassionate hearts, hearts that will suffer with a suffering world. And so if you need to grow in having a heart that hurts 
for the world, a heart that hurts for the kingdom of God, start with prayer. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Really practically, maybe you're awesome at evangelism. It's not my experience personally. It's not my spiritual gifting, but maybe that's your spiritual gifting. Maybe you just love to tell people about Jesus and it's easy and natural for you. Your application is to grab people like me who frankly suck at evangelizing and say, hey, let me show you how to do this. Come with me on the streets of Everett and I'm gonna show you how I serve people. I'm gonna show you how I preach the gospel, how I explain how good Jesus is. You're really gifted and we need your gifting in the church, not just to be a gifted person, but to teach people. So maybe during the service, grab someone and say, you know what? I was praying and I just really felt like the Lord wanted me to share this with you. Come after service with me. Let's get coffee later this week and we'll just practice sharing the gospel with a barista. If you don't relate with any of these or find yourself neatly in any of these tiers of application, I'll just give you really easy application. The harvest is plentiful and the workers are few in this church. We need people to serve in kids ministry. We need people to serve in youth group. We need people on the prayer team. We need people in the sound booth. And that's a really, really easy way to love others. If you find yourself without any application, and the band starts to play, communion happens, and you find yourself sitting around, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at someone in your aisle and I want you to grab them and say, let's pray to the Lord of the harvest. Jesus said, my house shall be a house of prayer for all the nations. Let's not get shy about praying in church. Is that okay? Can we do that church? Can we pray to Jesus and cry out to send workers into Everett in Snohomish County? So with that church, will you stand with me as we pray and seek our God and King? Jesus, we stand before you and we confess the need is great but our God is greater. Our fears, insecurities, our sin and deficiencies are great, but you are greater, Jesus. You're the good shepherd and you told us your sheep hear your voice. And so we expect Jesus as we worship you, as we partake in communion, as we get prayer, we will hear your voice. We will be encouraged and ministered to as we join you in the thing that you've been doing since the beginning of time, as we go on mission with our missionary God, we will experience your love, Jesus. And so we confess our need for you is great, God, but you are greater than our need. So come and meet us in this time. And it's in your name we pray, amen.